Hi everyone, welcome to the Ashley Barlow Company podcast. I'm Ashley Barlow, your host. If you are a parent, a teacher or someone who works at a school, or you're a community member, a volunteer or a staff member at an organization that supports people with special education plans, a coach, a tutor, or even a grandparent, you're in the right place. Sit back with an ice cold glass of lemonade, put on your walking shoes and grab some headphones, roll down the windows and cruise. Ready, set, go. Educate, advocate, collaborate. Welcome back to another episode of Special Education Advocacy with Ashley Barlow. I'm Ashley Barlow and I'm so happy you're here. Today we want to talk a little bit about mindset. I have had so many meetings this school year that have gone poorly. And that is super duper rare. Prior to this school year, I had really only ever had two meetings that went poorly. And of those two meetings, both resolved fairly quickly in a follow-up meeting. I really seriously had not had an IEP meeting that had gone super duper sourly for no reason. And this year I have had so very many. And I really have spent a lot of time thinking about why meetings are going poorly and what we can do to fix them. And I truly think that the, that the reason that they're going poorly lies in mindset. We need to adjust our mindsets at the IEP table and throughout the school year with our advocacy and now is the time. So let's start with a couple of facts. Teachers are exhausted, exhausted. Now I wanna tell you in many other industries, my industry, my husband's industry, think about your own industry. In many other industries, we have been given a break. We can work flexible hours, we can work from home, we get um, COVID days, maybe five days a year that we can take for mental health, for quarantine, for illness. We um, get maybe even reduced hours with the same pay. There's bonus pay for certain things. In many industries, we are given an allowance to be normal during this COVID pandemic. In education, teachers not only have not been given that break, but they are expected to carry on as though everything is okay. They are expected to roll with the punches, to cover classes for their peers. You know, in my district, we, in this school year, since um, January of 2020, we've not gone um, to remote learning, which is, I think, pretty unique in our area. And consequently, teachers aren't getting their planning periods. They aren't getting the time that's allotted in their contract to plan because they're covering for other classes. And that can be stressful. You know, being a substitute teacher is stressful and they, and they essentially turn into a substitute teacher. So they don't have the same allowances that many other people in many other industries have. And in fact, their jobs are harder. Their jobs are requiring them to pivot every single minute of the day. And they're expected to continue to do it all all the while doing their job well, teaching, and helping the students to cope with all of those changes as well. Teachers are tired. Administrators sit on your IEP team. Administrators are trying to balance the interests of all of these people. The parents that still want and know that their children are entitled to their IEP services. Of course, that's what we talk about here. The teachers who are exhausted, the the administrators feel terribly that the teachers are so exhausted the financial interest, the political interest that have all of a sudden really crept their way into schools in a very divisive way. All of these different interests, they're trying to balance. And so when we ask for something that might seem really small, that what the administrators are thinking in the backs of their minds is, 
if I add one more thing to this teacher's workload, the poor teacher is going to have a nervous breakdown. And that is something that lies on the administrator all the time. I told an assistant superintendent recently that I've never felt so empathetically toward people in middle management because the school board and the superintendents are making decisions about how we're going to learn, what curriculum we're going to use when we're on remote. Are we gonna use a calamity day or are we gonna call it a school day? Um, or are we gonna go ahead and take the snow day? All of those things. But the, those people are making the decisions and the assistant superintendents, the directors in the central office or the board office, the principals, they have to go out and say it to the people. They have to deliver the message to the parents and to the students. And they have to act like they think it's a good decision. They have to act like they are okay with it. And not only that, but they have to act like everything's going to be okay, when in fact, they might know that it's not going to be okay. But they're the messengers that have no decision making, which is really, really difficult in these times. They are exhausted and they're trying to balance all of the different things that are coming into them. Another fact that I mention quite often is that everybody at the IEP table is trying to do their job. Everybody is trying to do what they think is right. Nobody and if anybody does, it is a very few percentage, but I'm gonna go ahead and say nobody goes into education to be mean. Nobody goes into education to keep a child from receiving services. Nobody goes into education to say, I am going to deny access to a free appropriate public education to children on IEPs or children that are entitled to IEPs. Nobody goes into education intentionally to discriminate. And if they do, I hope the system weeds them out. But to the extent that anybody does, those people are very, very few and far between. Now, I will tell you that I acknowledge that there are people that are burned out. There are people that don't belong in the system anymore. That is one of the reasons that I left the classroom because I saw in just three years how quickly the job could burn you out, how cynical the job could make you. And I didn't want to get sucked in to the retirement system and the other benefits of being a teacher and to, to stay because of those reasons and to not stay because of the job because I loved the kids and I loved the, the content and I loved the schedule and all the other things about teaching. I loved because I didn't want to be one of those cynical people. So I will acknowledge that of course there's plenty of cynicism in education, but nobody really goes into it for that reason. And therefore we should be able to tap into that, that goodness, that intent, during meetings. And then another fact is there is a very big learning curve at every IEP meeting and in every IEP team. There's a learning curve, right? I mean, if you're a parent, you know there's a huge learning curve. You have to learn special education, like the laws and the advocacy strategies and the communication and the record keeping, and I won't overwhelm you with anything else. But you have to learn all of that stuff, not to mention like how it's gonna be done. So if your child has dyslexia, you want to familiarize yourself with different dyslexia programming, um, uh, curricula like Orton Gillingham and Barton and um, Wilson and all of the things. If your child has sensory processing disorder, you want to look and see what kind of curricula or what kind of activities could we do to help my child to, um, to meet their sensory needs. So parents have a huge learning curve. But the teachers and the administrators at the table also do. So the school staff has to learn every student. One of my favorite assistant, one of my, I think it was a principal actually, my favorite principal, what he did, and my kids never had this guy, but he taught in our district. 
He had an index card with every child's name and photograph on the front, and he would quiz himself on their names so that on the first day of school, he knew every single child's name. So their name and their, um, their school picture went on the index card. And then on the back of the index card, he would write a few things about the child, maybe a sport that they played or a sibling's name or um, some kind of interest that the child had, something about the child so that he could relate to the child. Now, I'm not saying every administrator does that, but the, the school people certainly have to know the children. They have to know their names. They have to know a little bit about their personalities and their home life. And, and if they're doing a good job, they really have to know quite a bit about them in order to be able to meet them where they are, particularly in special education. But then in addition to that, they need to know about the child's background. What goals have they had? How did they do on their goals? Where did progress stop? And why did the progress stop? What kind of students will help to support the child? And what kind of students do we not want at the child's table? What, what, how does the child do in specials? What kind of support does the child need when accessing the rest of the school environment, the gen ed environment, the um, cafeteria, the playground, the elective classes? They have so much to learn about each particular student. And then sometimes there's new strategies they need to learn. They might not have had a student with central auditory processing disorder or even dyslexia if they're a newer student. They might not have really been um, familiar with executive functioning disorders. And so they need to learn about that. There's a learning curve in order to figure that out. And what I say so often in meetings is, hey, listen, we didn't know. When mom and dad, I don't ever call anybody mom or dad, I don't know why, it's a pet peeve of mine, but when my client, Mrs. Jones or Sarah or whatever the person's name is, um, found out that their child had fill in the blank, right? I'll use myself as an example. When we found out Jack had Down syndrome, it wasn't like all of a sudden all of the information about Down syndrome just flooded our brains and our souls. No, we had to go out and we had to learn it. And that took a second and we learned as we went. But teachers are expecting that they're only going to have a student for a year in a lot of circumstances. And so they have this kind of immense pressure to learn about the disability, to learn about um, particularly teaching, particular teaching strategies or teaching methodologies or curricula that might be on the IEP or might help the child. So there's a learning curve even for the teachers. So everyone is learning the different processes and the different pieces of the kid and the different curricula. And then on the team, we work as a team, right? So everyone on the team is learning about everyone else in that particular setting, on that particular team. Personality, behavior, communication, frequency of communication, all of those things. We're learning all of those things. And this, friends, simply takes time. And so therefore, grace is very, very important. So what's this mean? What's this mean about why things don't go particularly well? What's this mean about how we um, can work in the IEP setting? What's this mean about why meetings are going badly? We shouldn't stop at grace. We should go to what I like to call relentless optimism. What's relentless optimism? You must believe that everyone at the table wants to help. You must believe that into your soul. You must believe that everybody at the table wants to help. You must believe that the solution to the problem exists and that people want, people want to find that solution. You have to internalize that. You have to truly believe that they want to help. You have to believe that there's a better way. If something isn't working, you have to believe that you can get it done. And you have to believe that the team can work together to get an agreement. 
Sure, there's going to be disagreements, differences of opinion, and that conflict, that ideological conflict, that's what you want. You want the team to get better. You want people to push one another and thought and process and strategy. You want ideological conflict. But you also have to believe that the team can work together in order to reach an agreement. Now listen, this is optimistic. This is relentless optimism. And I, optimism is not naivete, okay? I know lots and lots of people that are very naively optimistic and they get nowhere. So I am not talking about naive optimism. I'm talking, if your kids are listening, turn it down for a second. I'm talking about badass optimism. Okay, I'm talking about optimism that is a confidence. It's a can-do attitude. It's problem solving. It's collaboration. It's supporting. It's cheerleading in so many ways. This kind of optimism is tedious because you've got to get into the nitty gritty. You've got to continue to, to push the team to a yes. You've got to continue to say, okay, but why? Okay, but what if? Okay, how about if we tried? Okay, who else can help us? It is tedious. You have to be relentless in doing it. It is truly making offers that they can't refuse. And the way that you do that is you have to get into their interest. You have to use that interest-based negotiation that we talk about in the ABC course, that we talk about in the negotiation workshop, that we talk about so often here in this Ashley Barlow community. This optimism is relentless. It is being a yes man. I wanna tell you about my dad. My dad is an attorney. And my dad raised me, my brother says that we were raised entirely differently. I don't know, cause I'm the baby. There's six years between my brother and me, which means that as I went to every school, he was leaving the school. And it means as I was starting to become a human, like in middle school, my brother was gone. He was already at college and then he went on to med school. And then of course, all of the things that follow med school, that internship year and that residency and so we would go visit my brother but my brother was really not home all that often he was also a college athlete and so his summers were even cut short and while my brother was a wonderful brother and continues to be he and I simply weren't raised um in his opinion very similarly but certainly we were not raised at the same time we were not in the same phases of life at the same time and so my experience with my dad was somebody that didn't really sweat the small stuff. And I know that's really common once you've raised one human. <laughs> they knew what to worry about and what to, what to not worry about. And my parents didn't really worry about me. I was pretty much left to my own devices because I was making good decisions and grades and I was doing just fine. But I would go to my dad with a problem. My dad's office was on my way home from school. And so, you know, maybe once a month I would stop in my dad's office and I might have a social problem. I might have um, something that I need and, and I don't have the time to go get it because of a practice or a club or something like that. It could have been like a, a big to do that I needed to work out. Never once in my life has my dad said, I just don't think we can do that. Never. My dad has always said, okay, well, here's our timeline. Here's what our goal is. Let's see what we can do. And together, he and I would problem solve. We'd figure a way out of it. So it could have just been, dad, my goggles broke yesterday and I have practice at four o'clock and it's already 3.15 and there's no way I'm gonna get goggles and you know how teenagers would do. And my dad would say, okay, well, we have 45 minutes and it's only 18 minutes to get out to Walmart. We're gonna go get you some cheap Walmart goggles. And um, let's see, I'm gonna grab my keys and we'll get out to the car. And I bet you I can get you to Walmart and back from Walmart and drop you off at the YMCA for practice and everything will be fine. What, what's so wrong if you're two minutes late, but at least you have goggles? 
every single time I went to my dad with an issue, something as small as that or something big, like a big social thing, or, you know, as I aged, maybe as a big boyfriend issue, my dad always said, okay, well, let's see how we can figure ourselves out of this situation. Some of those things were really big, but there was this confident optimism, this relentless, I can figure it out, a can do attitude that got us out of there. Now it takes the nitty gritty. It really seriously takes the nitty gritty. And I get into the nitty gritty really, really significantly in that ABC course, in that negotiation workshop. I'll spare you the details today. We're talking about mindset. In my special education and advocacy conference, which we just finished on Saturday, and I'm so grateful that you attended and that we um, had such a lovely conference, somebody posted a comment in one of the sessions on 504s. And this person works as a special education advocate and said that they had a student at a school um, where a particular teacher was not recognizing the 504. In fact, the 504 allowed the child extra time on assessments and um, the science teacher, I think, said, well, we don't provide extra time on assignments. It's a science department policy, which, you know, you and I would say is a crack of, you know what, but that's what the issue was. That was the problem. And this advocate said, how do I get past it? And my answer was relentless optimism. You know the answer is you have to because of 504. You know that <laughs> the answer is, well, that's mandated at law. But if you go in and say, well, it's mandated at law, they're gonna say, we don't care, that's our policy. Okay, so now what we have to do is we have to be relentlessly optimistic and know that we can show them the right way. If we stay stuck, if we say, well, they're saying it's policy, they're dumb, they don't know the law, they aren't gonna follow the law, we will get nowhere. And so it's all about mindset. If you know you can do it, you will. If you are relentlessly optimistic, you will get it done. Jack Barlow is on a Sing the Movie kick. We are watching Sing a lot in our house. And there's that Mr. Moon guy that runs the orchestra. Now, if you haven't seen Sing, um, it's about a, I guess he's a koala bear um, named Mr. Moon. You're gonna understand, I did not research this before I, um, before I did this. So um, I'm bad with animals and I don't really watch TV. <laughs> so bear with me. This is the way I interpret this movie. Mr. Moon, I think is a koala bear and um, he owns a theater that is in a state of disrepair. And what he wants to do is he wants to have a, an American Idol type competition in his theater and he thinks that it is going to raise a bunch of money and he's going to be able to repair his theater. And so he invites this cast of characters onto his show. Um, and then kind of a plot twist in the movie is that he intends to do a $1,000 reward and his old lady secretary, um, who is some kind of lizard with a, um, with a, a, um, a false eye, a prosthetic eye, um, she accidentally types in zero zero and so now it's a one hundred thousand dollar reward and he barely could scrape up a thousand dollars including like his wristwatch and so now he's got a money problem as well mr moon is the most optimistic guy in the world and it's not a naive optimism he really is aware of the circumstances he's aware that his theater is in a state of disrepair but he's like that's okay that's okay i'm gonna have this show and he's he becomes aware that the um award is 100 thousand 100 times what he intended it to be and he says that's okay that's okay we will find more money 
He loved his theater. He loved his community. He loved those contestants on his show and he was going to find a way. He was relentlessly optimistic throughout the entire movie and he is endearing. If you have seen this show, you know that you are endeared to Mr. Moon. When Mr. Moon speaks, you're like, oh, oh, that's awesome. You want to be relentlessly optimistic so that the other people at the table are like, oh, oh, okay, well, we can do that. You're right. That's awesome. Let me give you an example of something that happened um, to me very early on into my career as a special education attorney. I went to an IEP meeting for a family that said that they were having trouble with inclusion. This child had an intellectual disability and the district wanted to put this child in an, um, in a self-contained unit, in a self-contained classroom. Now this school had never really, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> this school had never really done a, um, an inclusive IEP. They had never really had a child with an intellectual disability in a general education environment at all, much less a very largely inclusive environment. And these parents were asking that the child be in the general education setting in early elementary, like first or second grade, for like 80% of the day. So the school was not super familiar with how this could work. They didn't have a ton of supports in place. They didn't have a ton of supports in their community. It was a fairly remote area. Um, and the child was transferring in from another district. So it wasn't even their IEP that they were looking at in the beginning. So the school was very apprehensive, but that apprehension was largely coming out of ignorance or inexperience. They just hadn't experienced it and they had a big learning curve to figure out how they could do it and what they needed to do. Now I could have spent a lot of time talking about the objective, right? The law, the research, um, the child, expert opinions, and we did. That was our first strategy, right? Like go for the low hanging fruit. Well, the law says you have to do this. And let's really dive into the profile of the child. And here's what research says on inclusion. If you have taken my inclusion workshop, you know that this is the stuff that I talk about first. And then we tried this subjective. The parents really wanted to have another meeting where we brought in um, grandparents, therapists. We had letters from coaches and other parents. Um, we had people cry. <laughs> We tried the subjective, didn't work. We tried networking. My, my clients had um, connections within the school district, within the community. Um, they had meetings with very important people in the district, didn't work. We tried time. We said, okay, what about if we just kind of call the meeting now, give everybody a little bit of time and we come back in four or six weeks still didn't work. So friends, we went to cheerleading. We knew that we were not going to take no for an answer. We knew that this district could do it. We knew that this little school could do it. We wanted it for the school. We wanted it for the child ultimately, and we knew we could do it. So we went to cheerleading. We said, we want this for your district. We want this for your school. We want this for you, teacher. We want this for you. And we know you can do it. We are here to support you. We aren't asking for the moon. We just want a shot at this. We just want the opportunity. Let's do it together. We went really heavy on the collaboration. And we said, listen, we aren't shooting for the moon. We aren't asking that you become the best inclusive classroom. We know there's going to be bumps in the road. We know, oh, that's a Mr. Moon reference. That's funny. <laughs> we were just talking about Mr. Moon on Sing, and I said, we're not shooting for the moon. You gotta tie it all together. But we even had that little bit of humility. Listen, we know there's going to be issues here, and that's okay. We're gonna be graceful. We're gonna give you a little bit of grace when you have an issue. We gave them this collaborative, cheerleading type of spirit a Ted Lasso kind of spirit. 
And that's what finally worked. I looked in, in this case, it was the principal. I saw the principal and I saw her eye and there was like a, hmm, maybe we could do this. Maybe this could be good for my school. Let's do it. I went straight into that principal and said, I think you're thinking something. I wanna hear what you're saying. And we got it done. We tried it all friends, but we weren't gonna give up. We had this relentless optimism. Now, at the beginning of today's episode, I talked a little bit about some of the mentalities that are not working with my clients at IEP tables. One that I'm seeing quite a bit is a victim mentality. And listen, I feel like I am a victim to the unfairness that this COVID pandemic has instituted. So if you feel like a victim, amen, high five. I feel you, sister. I'm right there with you. I feel like a victim of it. I had my kid home all year. And I started a business. I am completely exhausted. Um, my kid's development is extremely slow. And um, subjectively, it feels even extremely slower because I'm tired and I'm tired of, <laughs> of it. I'm tired of waiting for the development. Um, and I'm tired of playing with the same toys because we are playing with the same toys that we played with in March of 2020 and I'm playing with them a lot more than I ever have in the history of me because typically I've had babysitters and friends and therapists and many other people that have come in to help me. And I just simply don't have that help. And so I feel like a victim too. But when you go into the school and there is a solution and you are not even listening to the solution, you are not even thinking about the solution, you are not considering the solution, you are not pushing the school back with some kind of counter solution, you are not problem solving because you are stuck in, well, that's not gonna work. I've been around this block before. You're offering remote learning and we're not gonna do it. You're offering compensatory education, but we gave you the chance and that's not gonna work. And you aren't articulating where your hesitations are and how we can work together to solve them, you're never gonna get anywhere. That victim mentality is not gonna get you anywhere. You have to continue to push. You have to continue to say, okay, this is where we are now. This is where I want to be. And what information do they need from me in order to get to yes? you have to continue with the relentless optimism. Another thing that I see so often is when um, parents kind of have a never enough mentality. Yeah, right. They're never gonna give me fill in the blank. It's never gonna be enough. Well, listen, you are on a team. And just like at work and in your community and volunteer positions with your friends, nobody ever gets exactly what they want. What you're looking for is, is my child getting what my child is entitled to? And I recognize that there are all of these balancing interests, right? So if we spend forever in speech therapy, if we had a child that was in speech, this, I don't know that this um, has happened in any of my cases, but let's just say arguendo, we had a child that needed speech therapy three hours a day. Well, that would take away from a lot of ability to interact with peers, to interact with their typical or their peer language models. And so if the child has an interest in getting that kind of access to peers, then we might not say yes to three hours of speech therapy because there's a competing interest of peer interaction. That never enough mentality gets in the way all the time. Let's not focus on what you're not getting. Let's focus on what you are getting and see if we can really maximize what you are getting with some additional factors. And then this kind of like not willing to compromise, not gonna budge kind of mentality. I'm seeing that far more often. I'm seeing that parents are literally at their wits end and they're like, no, I'm not gonna do it. Nope, unless you give me this, I'm not gonna do it. And that is not relentlessly optimistic. That's the way you buy a car. That's not the way you advocate for a child in special education. 
And so whether you're trying to convince that science teacher that you are entitled to double time, whether you're trying to go out and get the goggles before practice is started, whether you're trying to build that theater and make all the repairs, whether you're fighting for inclusion, you have to be relentlessly optimistic. You have to have that can-do attitude. You have to be graceful in cheerleading and believing that everybody wants the right solution for the child. It's okay to push one another, but at the end of the day, you have to believe that the solution is there and you've got to keep chasing the solution. I hope you are able to implement relent relentless optimism into your advocacy. We will see you next week, same time, same place.